In this video, I'm going to go through trochanteric bursitis or greater trochanteric pain syndrome for therapists. So it's going to be a video that goes through the pathophysiology of the condition, epidemiology, diagnosis of the condition, and then treatment and exercises for the condition. So the pathophysiology of this condition is that it's basically a tendinopathy of the um, subgluteus medius and maximus and also the glute minimus as well. Also, there's often some trochanteric bursitis that's seen in this condition. It's not completely understood. Um, there aren't really the elements of inflammation often with this condition like redness, swelling, heat. Um, so we're not really sure at the moment whether it is a true inflammatory condition, um, but people often just call it inflammation of that bursa or trochanteric bursitis still. One of the first causes of this condition is repetitive microtrauma to the area, and this can be from a traumatic cause or from non-traumatic. Also, there's a big uh, issue with overuse of the area, the musculature around there. So overuse of glute medius and glute minimus can cause this condition to, to come on. In patients who are having repetitive hip abduction movements, and this can be something that can be seen. With older patients, you can find that if they are having falls, then that can cause traumatic onset of these as well. And with more sedentary patients, you might find that them constantly lying on their hips will also inflame that area and cause this condition. Epidemiology wise, um, this condition is, affects all ages. It affects both men and women, but we know that men uh, are slightly underrepresented with this condition. So there's about 15% of women and 8% of men. And it tends to be more common in middle-aged women, which we'll come on to in a second as to the reason why although they can still be seen in young um, athletic females as well. First reason why it's more common in women is there seems to be a smaller gluteus tendinous, uh, tendinous insertion into the femur, so there's a um, smaller area to dissipate tensile loads through that area. There's also a shorter gluteal moment arm, which leads to reduced efficient efficiency in that muscle. There tends to be increased peripheral adiposity in women, and a lower femoral neck shaft angle as well. So all of these are things that can lead into the fact that women get it more. Prognosis wise, we know with this condition that the tendon uh, and with any tendinopathy, it can take a long time to improve. And with this condition, you're looking at six to nine months really of concerted effort with their rehab. So it's one of those things, if someone's not getting better, you need to figure out or ask them how long they've been doing what they've been doing, also what they've been doing. Because if they haven't been loading, then that's probably not gonna be getting better. So wanna make sure that you, you patients understand how long it takes for them to get better. So our key subjective markers to figure out if a patient's got this hip condition, obviously number one would be lateral hip pain. Number two, they're often worse when lying on that hip. They're often worse with activities such as stairs and single leg activities where they're weight bearing on that single leg. They can also be worse with prolonged sitting and then going to stand up and very, very stiff in the mornings. Also a quick uh, differential for the subjective would be an absence of problems putting on socks in the morning, which may be more relevant in osteoarthritis of the hip. So our five most useful objective tests, which are if these are positive or a number of these are positive, you wanna be very suspicious or be hypothesizing that it is gluteal um, tendon pain syndrome or greater trochanteric pain syndrome, would be number one, palpation of the greater trochanter, so pain on palpation over the greater trochanter. Faber's test, resisted abduction test, resisted external derotation test, and the stance test. So all of these five tests I've put into a single video, um, which I'm gonna link somewhere on the screen now. So if you want to know how to do these tests and how to perform them, it's gonna be a very quick video that you can go to and literally just, I'll run through each of those tests very quickly so you can see what you need to do. So treatment option wise, really, first of all, it's always going to be conservative management. So that's going to be physio and loading, which we'll go on to in a second, of the tendon and loading and strengthening of that area. Um, NSAIDs can be useful, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, and then icing the area. The other thing that's massive, for not just for these patients, but for loads of patients, is weight loss. And we know how much of an impact that has, almost more so than lots of the other things that we can do for a patient. So if they're overweight significantly, we really wanna hammer them with you know, advice and education, not in a way that's um, negative, but in a way that's understanding and in a way that's trying to support them. There are often lots of services in local areas for help with weight loss. And so signposting these patients to there can be really useful. Failing this, then uh, corticosteroid injections into the bursa and the lateral hip 
um, can be quite useful with these patients. Um, research tends to suggest that there's no real massive difference if it's ultrasound guided or blind, but they, uh, that would be the next step if someone really wasn't progressing with treatment or if they were really struggling with the exercises due to pain. There is then also a surgical procedure for this where you have a um, trochanteric bursectomy, so they remove the trochanteric bursa, or they sometimes do an ITB release for these uh, conditions. Um, both of these have really mixed outcomes, so it's not advisable to have this done unless absolutely necessary. And in terms of rehab, the best exercises are really going to be de dependent on where that person is. So if someone is in the early stage of this condition and they're really acutely flared up, you probably want to load the tendon, but you don't want to load it too much because it's just going to make it too sore. Um, and there's a really good paper, which I'm going to link somewhere here. Um, I'll go into a review of this maybe a little bit as well, either in this video or on another video, where it talks about all the different um, exercises commonly prescribed um, for the glutes and the amount of contraction that that glute muscle was going under. And they labeled it into kind of low, moderate, high, and very high. So it's really nice paper because you can actually go into that paper, look at the exercises that are are high, look at the exercises that are low and actually then suit your patient to where they are along the journey. In terms of which exercises to use, I've done a video for patients and on that video I go through the specific exercises for them to do when they're in the early phase and when they're in the later phase, so when they're, you know, when they're getting a little bit better. Um, and so that's a great resource to check out. So if, again, there'll be a link in this video right now where you can go over to that specific video, have a look at the exercises that, that are prescribed and how to do those exercises. And that's it guys. So that's all things gluteal uh, pain and greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, it is really, really helpful if you give us a like. If you like this sort of stuff, then subscribe and press the bell icon. You'll receive more um, notifications of videos that are coming out like this. And I hope to see you next time.